that's beautiful. You played them in. I should keep you, the more you played, the more people walked in. Oh. You should play some more. <laughs> is it not great to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. It is so great to be in the house of the Lord this day. And I'm so glad that you are here, that we can join our voices, our prayers uh, together this day in worship. Um, I hope you will take a moment, if you are a Facebooker, to sign in. Let people know where you worship and that you are here today. And if you are, the, we, we are now online, so those of you online and at home, let us know. Comment. Let us know that you're with us. So back in 1992, I got my first mom car. My girls were six and three, and I had gotten in, uh, the, my oldest daughter had just started kindergarten, and I was in a carpool. So I decided I needed a little something more than, than what we had, so we got a van. We got a, a van, and we were trying to decide. We had an option. You could, it could be a, a, an eight-seater, and you could get a bench seat in the middle, or it could be a seven-seater, and you could get captain's chairs. Well, we opted for captain's chairs because Jamie, our youngest, was always touching her sister. They were just too close on the bench seat in the car that I had, so we specifically decided, let's get captain's chairs so Jamie would not bother her sister any longer. I'm driving, and I hear from the back seat what I had heard for years, months, ever since that child was born. Mom, Jamie's touching me. And I'm driving, and it's like, well, how could she be touching you? I mean, we specifically got captain's chairs so your sister would not touch you. Mom, Jamie's touching me. She can't be touching you. Mom, Jamie is touching me. I get to a red light. I look back, and lo and behold, that child of mine in her booster seat is leaning and stretching <laughs> as far as she can, touching her sister. Well, our red letter question this morning is, who touched me? Who touched me? Perhaps that question will be a window for us to examine how deep our trust and our faith goes in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord of mercy and strength, Remind us again in this time of worship that your power to heal our lives is there and available for us. Open our hearts to believe in your restorative power and your great compassion. Give us the trust, the faith, the courage to put you first and foremost in our lives. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand. We will join together in our call to worship and remain standing through the glory of Patri. Jairus needed a miracle, so Jesus told him, Do not fear, just believe. When the unnamed, unclean, untouchable outcast touched Jesus, she took these words to heart. Do not fear, just believe. We too come this day reaching for a miracle, needing to touch Jesus, seeking to be healed. In our faith and in our doubt, we find hope and comfort in the words of our Lord. Do not fear, just believe. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in singing our hymn of praise. It's known in your hymnals, number 526. What a friend we have in Jesus, number 526.
now as one body, let us affirm our faith. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Caitlin coming, but all your friends left you hanging this morning. Yes, so today apparently was National Half Family in Town weekend at our church. And so we had a very full, full weekend, uh, a full Sunday morning of our friends. We had tons and tons of kids in the back, but as you know, with our church, we have a lot of friends that are related to each other, and they all have family in this weekend. So they are going to visit with their families um, and enjoy that time before family leaves this afternoon. But if I have somebody that is young of heart that would like to come sit with me for just a minute, if not, it's okay. My feelings won't be hurt. Just a little bit. Nobody? Okay. Well, I will tell you what I was going to tell my kids. What we have been talking about in kids' church on Sunday morning and on Wednesday nights is uh, we've been working through the Ten Commandments, just like RL is on Wednesday nights, and one of the things that we were talking about this week was obeying God. And we talked about how obeying God looks really different. It's not just always a, you have to do exactly what I say, exactly when I say it. But obeying God sometimes is something a little bit quieter that goes on within us. Because over and over in the Bible, and we talk about it in Sunday school a lot, that God doesn't always give us direct actions. A lot of times, what does he say? He says, be still and believe, or be still and know. So a lot of times what obeying God looks like is by believing what he says. An act of obedience for God is us believing he is who he says he is, and that when he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And so our kids this week learned about obedience and what that looks like and about believing and what that looks like and we talked about the difference between God and fairy tales and how even though sometimes things like miracles like what we're going to talk about today even though sometimes things like miracles that happen in fairy tales we're like well that could never happen obedience with God is believing that when God says he's going to do something even if we don't know how it's going to happen our act of obedience is believing that he is who he says he is. And so I just wanted to share that with you, that that is what our kids are kind of learning this week, and we will continue that on Wednesday nights um, after they get back from seeing family. But I will turn it back over to you. All right. So, Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Belief can be so hard. Um, one of my favorite scriptures is Matthew 14, because... That's the one where Jesus walks on water and he invites Peter to join him on the water. And as long as Peter stays focused on Jesus, he can walk on water. But as soon as he's distracted, he begins to sink. And we're the same way. So let us go to God in prayer this morning. Lord, help us to stay focused on you. Help us to follow you better so that you can change our heart, guide our spirit, and fill us with energy so that we can do your work. 
In Jesus' name we pray and sing this morning. Amen. Please, let's stand and let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision. It's number 451 in your hymnals. Please stand. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of prayer, I want to just share with you a few uh, joys and concerns we want to lift this day. Ruth Brooks had surgery earlier this week. I think it was Wednesday. She is home now and healing. It was a very successful surgery. I called her Thursday after she got home from the hospital and uh, she said, yeah, the doctor said I needed to, to move around, that that would help in healing. So I think I'll bake some cookies for your trip to Thibodeau. So, so she's doing very well, but we want to pray for her continued healing. We also want to surround Nancy Richards and their family uh, with prayer on the passing of Lou uh, earlier this week, Wednesday evening. His celebration of life will be in this sanctuary on Saturday, October the 2nd at 10 o'clock. And we will have a visitation beginning at 9 up until the time of serv service. And Nancy has asked specifically that we be sure to mask up for this service. Well, the flowers today, the plant today is in honor of Virginia Rand. She, uh, her birthday uh, is today. She is 103 years old. That is just amazing. I talked to her on the phone this week to wish her happy birthday. She is as sharp as a tack. She was grateful for the call and she sends her very best wishes to all of you. There's another birthday in the house today, and that is Arthur Perry back there in the back. Happy birthday, Arthur. We're so glad it is your birthday. Other birthdays this week, uh, the Swans had birthday. So last Wednesday was Renita's birthday, and this week, this Wednesday, is Elmer's birthday, and then Jean Sanders had a birthday as well. Uh, last week. So happy birthday to all of you and what a blessing. Uh, we praise you on your birth because you are a blessing. Your life is a blessing to us and this church and so we celebrate that. Now as we come before the Lord let us pray. 
Loving Lord, as we enter into this sanctuary, this sacred space, may we also enter into worship of you with our whole selves as we sing, as we pray, as we affirm our faith. May we also live those words beyond these walls. May what we say and do in here be how we live out there. Forgive us, Lord, when our faith grows faint. Forgive us, Lord, when our walk is not congruent with our talk. Forgive us, Lord, when we give lip service to what we think we believe instead of complete confidence in you as our God. Move us beyond mere words to action, for we long to touch you. Strengthen our faith, for we long to find healing in your embrace. Restore our ragged hopes and tattered ideals. Rebuild our brokenness and reconcile our relationships so that our lives are pleasing in your sight and our actions show beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have put our whole trust in you with your grace. Hear now the prayers of our hearts as we lift before you those in need of help, those in need of your healing, those in need of your mercy. And now, Lord, may your Holy Spirit rest upon each one of us, dismantle our fears, Build up our faith, deepen our love, clarify our goals, sharpen our insight, widen our compassion, and open our minds to the new words you wish to speak into each one of us this day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today as we continue our red letter series with the questions that Jesus asked, we hear a good one today in the story of how Jesus healed the daughter of Jairus and the woman in the crowd. So here are these words. They come from Mark's Gospel, the fifth chapter. I'm going to start at the 21st verse, and I'm reading from the New International Version. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a crowd gathered around him while he was there. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus... He fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please, 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 please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed up against him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. 
because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt it in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, she realized that power had gone out from her, or at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around into the crowd and he asked, Who touched me? Who touched my clothes? You see all the people crowding around you? His disciples answered. And yet you asked who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, she told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Let us pray. Almighty God, still the busyness of our minds and open our hearts to you that we may hear your word for us this day. Amen. Well, have you ever had one of those days that you just had so many things to do and you had your to-do list all ready to go, but it seemed like you just kept getting interrupted one thing after another thing after another thing? You know, you got your list either on paper or on your phone and, and you're ready. You charge out the door and you go, okay, pick up dry cleaning, check. Drop the kids off at soccer practice check. Then you say, now that they're at soccer practice, this is a great time to catch up on all that paperwork and, and emails and phone calls. And so you rush off to the office because you know you've got just, just an hour and a half to get this important work done. No one is there because it's early Saturday morning. You settle into your desk chair, your desk chair. You, you open your secret drawer. You know the one I'm talking about. The drawer in your desk where you scoop all the things at the end of day so, so that when you come in, your desk looks neat. Just me? Am I the only one that does that? I got a secret drawer. You pull out your pile, and there is a secondary to-do list waiting for you to help you prioritize all those little slips of paper, emails that you have printed out, and, and sticky notes that you have jotted down things to remind you of what you need to do. And all of a sudden, you are interrupted by the phone ringing. Your child has sprained an ankle in soccer practice. Now what you thought was the important thing that you needed to do was usurped by something more important, a visit to the ER and x-rays and doctors. Well, that is exactly the kind of day that Jesus was having in our scripture this morning. It was interruption upon interruption upon interruption. All the important things that he thought that he was going to do kept getting interrupted by something else. So let me catch you up on the chronicles of our disciples. When we started this sermon series, if you remember, they were headed across the lake. A storm uh, comes up. Jesus said Jesus was tired. They'd, had, they'd spent the whole day preaching and teaching. They get into the boat. He takes a nap, but it's interrupted. It's interrupted by the disciples in a panic because of this storm that they thought was just going to capsize their boat. Jesus calms the storm and the disciples just in time for them to, to go ashore. They go ashore and, you know, they, Jesus wanted to teach and preach. And even that got interrupted because he comes across this guy we met last week named Legion, who was um, a demon-possessed man. Jesus takes the time to take those demons out of legion and then he goes on about his business on into town and that then 
They go back, get on the boat, they go back across the lake, which is what scripture reminds us. And that's when it happens. Interruption upon interruption upon an interruption. It's the story within the story within the story. So Jesus has a crowd that now is following him, which I'm not surprised at all, because on that side of the lake, he had just fed 5,000 people. But I'm pretty sure, because on the other side of the lake, you know, he made pigs fly. When, uh, when, when Jesus t cast out all those demons uh, out of legion, he sent them into a herd of pigs, and they go flying off a mountainside. I'm pretty sure a crowd is going to gather to see if he could do it again. So it doesn't surprise me at all that people are all crowded around Jesus to, to see what he's going to do next. But Jesus is excited because he's finally getting to do the first thing on his to-do to list, to tell as many people as possible the good news of a great God. When all of a sudden he's interrupted just one more time. He's this time, though, he's interrupted by Jairus. Now, Jarius isn't just an anybody. He is a somebody. Jarius is highly respected, well-educated. He's a very important leader in the church and in the community. Now, Jarius is the kind of guy that you go to if you have a problem. Jarius is the kind of go guy that you go to if you need help in some way. If you needed to complain about the trash pickup, you called Jarius. If you needed a, a, a lamp fixed, a street light fixed, you called Jarius. He was the kind of guy that got things done. One call, that's all. Jarius was that kind of guy to take care of business for you. But that's, that's not what's happening here. You know, Jarius is the kind of guy that you go to for help, but here he is totally out of character because he is in desperate need of help this day. So Jarius is going up to Jesus, not to shake his hand, not to welcome him to town, but he is falling at the feet of Jesus. He is begging for mercy because he's hoping, begging, begging for a miracle. Jarius was at his wit's end. Jesus was his last hope, his last resort. You see, his 12-year-old daughter lay dying. She was gravely ill, and, and Jarius was hoping that Jesus would would come and, and just lay hands on her. If he could just touch her, then, then maybe, just maybe, she would live. She would be made well. So Jesus agrees to, to leave that which he was hoping to do, to preach and teach about the good news of a great God, to do something more important, to help Jairus out. To help heal his daughter. When all of a sudden it happens again. <laughs> Yet another interruption. One more time. Because in the crowd is a woman. A woman who had spent all of her money on doctors. A woman who is unnamed. Unknown to any of us who was considered unclean and an outcast, an outcast from her community, an outcast from her church, an outcast from her family. A woman who, just like Jarius, was desperate. A woman who, just like Jarius, was at her wit's end. But a woman who, very much unlike Jarius, unnamed to us, unknown, outcast, wasn't just hoping for a miracle. No, indeed. She went reaching for it. 
Because you see in verse 28, it didn't say, if I just touch his clothes, maybe I will be healed. It didn't say that at all. No, indeed, what she says is declarative. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And when she does, when she does touch Jesus, <laughs> immediately Jesus asks our red letter question this morning. Who touched me? Who touched me? And you, you heard in scripture those disciples just kind of saying, what do you mean, Jesus? They're all touching you. You know, look around. There's all these people. But as soon as it happened, as soon as she touched him, Jesus knew it. All those people pressing up against him, all those people just reaching for him like a rock star on a red carpet. And yet this one, this one woman, this one hand reaching out in a crowd of many who touch him, this one woman is healed. He knew it. And she knew it. Because, why? Because of this one woman's great faith. And this woman didn't just have faith. She acted on that faith with great confidence. She expected Jesus to heal her. And it happened. Problem solved. Why? Because she knew God so well. They were so close that, of course, she knew that the Son of God would certainly help her out. Because if God could help her, then so could Jesus. I think that's where a lot of us miss the boat. We are struggling with a problem we are at our wit's end. And we've read every self-help book that we could possibly read on the subject. We have Googled it all over the internet. We've even watched YouTube videos until our eyes are blurry. We sit. We commiserate. We talk. We whine. We think. We complain. And then as a last resort... We take it to God. In kind of a jarious kind of way, we take it to God. Begging for mercy, thinking, well, Lord, if, if you think you might, then maybe so. But what if? What if? God was our first plan of action instead of our last resort. What might that look like? Last couple of weeks, we've been talking in our Bible study about the Ten Commandments. We've, we've just done the first two. We've talked about how God wants all of us. Not like, I mean, he does. He wants all of us, like all of us here. But he wants all of us, 100% of us, to be committed to him. God wants to be made first and foremost in our life before anything and anyone else. He wants us to have a relationship so close, so intimate, that the very breath that he breathes out is the air that we breathe in. That's how close he wants to be to us. So this question, this question who touched me, this question that Jesus asked, this question is an affirmation of faith. Because in that moment, in that moment, when that one woman in a crowd of so many people touched Jesus, his question who touched me, it affirmed not just her action, 
but it affirmed the depth of her faith that she had in Jesus Christ. So what about us? What about us? If we reached for Jesus, if we touched him, would our faith in him cause him to stop and look around and ask the question, who touched me? Would our commitment, would our trust, in the power of God to change lives, to change our lives, even register on Jesus' radar if we were the one, if we had been that one person, that one hand that reached out, do we have that kind of faith, that kind of deep faith, that kind of trust, that kind of commitment, do we? Are we ones who will make God, our first line of defense, instead of our last resort? Because, you know, faith in God is not about a religion to God, but a relationship with God. Is it that close? Is it that meaningful? That if we touched Jesus, he would know it. And we would know it. So I asked you, what needs to be touched? What needs to be changed? What needs to be done in your life? So that when you do touch Jesus, he will turn around and look and say, who touched me? Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we too come before you this day, reaching, stretching, asking, begging, pleading for a miracle, for your compassion, for your love, for your strength, for your wisdom, whatever it is, Lord, that we need. We know, we know. Or at least help us to know that you can truly and certainly and beyond a shadow of a doubt provide for us. Lord, let us be so close to you that you are the very air that we breathe. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a few ways that we can connect in the life of the church going on because there's a lot going on in the life of the church. So, you know, we're going to head down to South Louisiana. to, to We're not going to feed 5,000, but we're going to feed 500. And so we've been cooking all week in the kitchen, and many of you have been baking cookies. Well, we're going to cook one more day. we got about three more batches to make a chili mac and get it all ready for our trip. So if you are a pot stirrer, hmm, that's probably not a good thing to be some days, a pot stirrer. <laughs> but if you want to be a pot stirrer in a good way, 3 o'clock on Tuesday. And then if you uh, want to bake some cookies, I'm not sure what our, our, our cookie count is, but um, some of them accidentally um, uh, got broken uh, as we were, you know, and so we, you know, we might be short a cookie or two. I just I love it when a broken cookie comes my way. That, you, we got some good bakers up in this house. And then 6 o'clock Thursday morning, if you want a road trip with your pastor, uh, we're going to gather up here, load up our vehicles, and head to Thibodeau to warm this wonderful meal that you have all prepared and helped to prepare and serve it to the good people of the Thibodeau community. We also have Wednesday night gatherings. We have some wonderful small group studies going on that you can come be a part of. We also need some volunteers. So Rhonda Atwood is gathering a, a 
two at a time to come help in the kitchen. It's pretty easy work uh, as kitchen work goes, so come uh, volunteer for that because the more people that volunteer, the less often you have to do it. So that's not a bad thing either if you want to help in the kitchen. It's a Mexican night, so we're having chicken enchiladas, so that sounds absolutely delicious. And if you can't get enough food at the church, you know, we, we do like to eat. Um, you can, there's an insert in your bulletin this morning about a FOMP fundraiser coming up on October the 8th. And all the information you need is right there so you can participate in that. Well, if you didn't sign the registration pads, I invite you to do so before you leave out of here. You'll notice there's a QR code and different ways that you can give. And then last but not least, if you are ready to become a part of this great church uh, officially, I invite you to come forward as we sing our closing song. I know of a couple that is coming forward, so there's safety in numbers uh, if you want to join them. But if that makes you nervous... You can come see me in the back after the worship service. We are going to stand and sing hymn number 714. I know who I have believed. Believed. However that goes. Come on, let's stand and sing that together. I know not why God's Well, I want to welcome Wayne and Edith Tutt to the great congregation of First United Methodist Church of Alexandria. Welcome, welcome, welcome home. And I want to ask you the question that I know that you've been asked before because you're transferring your membership from another United Methodist Church over there in the great state of Texas. Uh, but I ask you, will you support this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Yes. Welcome aboard and welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you can uh, certainly, I'm going to send uh, Wayne and Edith on down the aisle, and uh, uh, I want you to greet them and meet them, so we'll send you out ahead of me. Uh, I want you to greet them and be sure to meet them as uh, you exit this day. I'm going to stand beside them, so you be sure to give them your name, because I'm, I'm still working on names of everybody. But I want to send you forth with this blessing in this challenge to be the light of Christ where you work where you play and where you live that you will be and bring that light to others and may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore amen